So, indie tier audience, we had a little glitch in my recording. Um, the video did not record my face in the Zoom that we recorded for this episode, but Lori is full of shining, so that's really all you need to see. I'm just going to post a video, a picture of my face when I'm talking. I hope it doesn't take away from the video, and I hope you still enjoy this podcast episode, despite my little technical error. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoy the episode. Welcome to NDTR Spotlight, the corner of the internet or NDTR Shine. I'm your host, Marie Lorraine. So fancy last year, 2021 was online and I did a podcast or an episode spotlighting the NDTRs that were featured at Fancy. And we only found one, but that one was enough hope. And um, running this podcast has been so fun, but today I am even more excited than, than normal because we were able to get Lori, the speaker at Fancy, on the podcast to share her experience, share her career, and share what she's doing. So very, very excited that she thought this podcast was professional enough to get on and share what she's doing. She has her master's of public health, and she's pursuing her EDD, or doctorate in education. She, you can find her online at Simplified Wellness on Instagram or Facebook. She is most confident in culinary food as medicine and plant-based nutrition. And her heart, you can definitely see her heart when I asked what was the most accomplishment or the biggest accomplishment she felt like she had in nutrition. It was sharing healthful foods with kids in the community as a food bank volunteer slash intern. So really has a heart for the community, for kids and for nutrition and, and making it practical in that culinary sense. And then lastly, I wanna mention her her presentation at Fancy, where she was one of the speakers, the title of it was the Ram, Sh Ram Chiefs Program, Building Skills and Self-Efficacy of Nutrition Professionals Through Culinary Instructions for Persons with Intellectual Disabilities. So, so many things she's doing, and she's also an adjunct instructor. So without further ado, make sure you listen to this whole spotlight, because I'm very, very thrilled to have someone who had the experience of speaking at Fancy, the biggest nutrition conference put on every year on this podcast. So Lori, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you. I'm super excited to be here. Um, this is such a great podcast and I love that you're highlighting this credential. It's really important. Thank you. It makes me happy to be able to highlight people like you and what you're doing. So we got to start off where and how did you first find out about the NDTR credential? Let's, let's take it back. Yeah, so um, I went back to school as an adult learner um, in 2012 to Westchester University uh, to do my bachelor's in nutrition and really didn't think that I wanted to be a registered dietitian. I had worked as um, the director of yoga teacher training for a national organization, but I went back to school and met just some of the most amazing professors at Westchester who are now my colleagues. And um, Jeannie Subak was one of those. And she was in that presentation at Fancy. So um, Dr. Subak has encouraged me all along the way to add to my knowledge base, to add the credential, whether or not I wanted to be an RD. It was something in between. And um, so, yes, I think as part of that DPD program, I saw the value in having that credential, even if I couldn't do an internship at that time. Mm, yeah, and that's great that you have professors who are like, talking about that credential in, in a positive light. And so 2012, so it sounds like you've been in school for a while because right now you're pursuing your doctorate. So with your master's of public health, what was that focus and what made you decide to do the master's of public health after the bachelor's degree? Right. I just, I felt like I wanted to learn more and clearly I still feel that way. Right. So next, who knows, I might do go for the uh, internship and RD credential, but um, I really wanted to continue learning. And I liked the master's in public health, because during my undergraduate, I had started volunteering at the local food bank uh, and doing nutrition education, working with um, like farm to food programs where one of the local schools that's a residential school grew food. And then they would just kind of give it to kids to take home. And I um, stepped in, was asked to step in and kind of fill a gap by showing quick and easy ways that that food could be used without a lot of other ingredients. And I just, I will never forget 
asking, holding up a zucchini and asking a group of six-year-olds, 30 some six-year-olds, what it was and nobody really knowing. Um, so that just got my heart right there. Yeah. And I really saw the value and importance of extending nutrition into public health and into the community. Mm -hmm. Simultaneously, I have um, a son with some pretty significant autism. And at that time, he was uh, growing up, starting to have some more challenges. And he also, we found out, had um, a really rare cancer and had to have part of his um, large intestine removed. And it caused a B12 deficiency. I was able to see kind of the role of nutrition in his life and his health and work with him on, um, as I talked about in the Fency presentation, on how can you take responsibility for your health and making your diet more healthful within your choices and what you want and what's important to you. Mm -hmm. So um, that master's in public health, I think it was perfectly timed within my own family within my volunteerism in the community and um, with my ability then as my applied learning experience to take that to a larger group of individuals with intellectual disabilities and autism and help their caregivers get more information on how to hold both independence and self-determination and health in the same educational space for their consumers that they supported. Wow. That story with the zucchini and the six-year-old, that's, that hits deep because it's like the things that you think are just second nature that, you know, when you're saturated in this field are just, it's not, it's not secondhand knowledge or knowledge for other people. And so, and then it's great that you were able to extend it to the intellectual disabilities and have that true understanding with your son with that. And so let's talk about that presentation. How did that, your master's degree and what you were doing filter in and turn into a fancy presentation? Again, it goes back to my colleagues. So I worked with um, Dr. Christaldi Sullivan and Dr. Subak on that presentation. And Dr. Subak and I worked very closely from the time I was an undergraduate to now um, within this realm of how do we promote independence? How do we promote nutrition for those who have the least access? And so um, my master's project was on improving knowledge for caregivers um, and working with individuals themselves who had intellectual disabilities on direct cooking. Uh, Dr. Subak and I worked in our foods lab in a lot of the culinary education classes for undergrads. She was doing her dissertation work on the specific field of working with some of the individuals who were transition age, so like right around 16 to 21 years old, who came to Westchester for um, physical, adaptive physical education activities. And so she wanted to add nutrition into that mix. And so right from the beginning, that was her dissertation topic. Um, she knew because I talked a lot about um, my son and my work. So we always worked together and collaborated um, for many years. Uh, so it was just continued collaboration on that topic. It we sounds just, just like that. working progress and some networking going on and then just the growing of that knowledge. So I want to ask, I think that topic is, is fascinating. When I was an undergrad, we did a, a small, very small little study on intellectual disabilities and nutrition. And we found that population has a higher risk for obesity, just in general, and just the lack of nutrition knowledge, like you're saying, just because there's so many things going on in life that nutrition kind of gets a back burner. So without giving away the full presentation, because I think you can still find it on Fancy, what like what really stood out to you in the research that you really emphasized or would be helpful for anyone knowing who's thinking about working with students with or um, with people with intellectual disabilities in the realm of nutrition? Yeah, so the research says, um, first of all, that the caregivers need to have the knowledge, anyone who's involved in support. And it's because of what I mentioned, which is Maybe a little repetitive, but it's really the biggest, one of the biggest issues is that when someone turns 18, just because they have an intellectual disability, 
we don't want to kind of force decisions on them, right? So there is this example that's often used um, at the state level that self-determination or the ability to make one's own choices is the most important thing. And so the example that I've heard a lot from people who work in the field with individuals with disabilities and supporting them is that there's this misconception that if that person wants to sit on the couch and eat Oreos all day, that's what they should be allowed to do. Wow. So, yeah. and, and they do have, you know, greater risks for obesity and health problems, um, not just because of nutritional issues, but because of income disparities, access to healthcare disparities, uh, lack of presumption of intelligence, um, and um, medications, right? A lot of medications that people with disabilities take in, um, lead to weight gain. So um, that's what the, the research all supports that, right? And it also supports the importance as with everyone else of directly getting involved in cooking and food preparation. So sometimes if someone has an intellectual disability, they might still live at home and their parents might cook all their meals for them and serve them. Or if they live in a group residence with a couple of other people, mm -hmm. or even a semi-independent, they might have someone who prepares meals for them because there are often concerns around them using the stove, using the oven, using knives, right? So there are all these things that I think can get in our head about certain groups of people and with intellectual disabilities, that's definitely one group where we're kind of afraid to give them that hands-on experience. So um, I know in our house, that was always a big thing. I was like, if that's what you want to eat, you're going to cook it, right? So um, it's, it's really important. And that's one of the things that we've seen to be so successful with Dr. Subak and the Ram Chef program is giving people choice encouraging people to try new things and giving them just the right amount of support so that they can be successful in the kitchen, but also be independent. That's a hard balance to find. And so I see why you have to do research and do it to figure out how to do it correctly because intellectual disabilities also, they vary as you, as you probably know. And so and so now it's now they don't have a, they can sit down and eat Oreos, but they also have the knowledge and the caregivers have the knowledge to help to avoid that, that. So that's a really great analogy and understanding of that. Thank you for explaining it so, so well. And so kind of going along with that presentation and, and the talking, what was just the experience like at um, Fincy and putting that on? I know it was online this year, which wasn't me for last year, was wasn't probably the most exciting thing, but what was that experience like? I think it was actually really exciting this year because we were able to record it ahead of time. So we were definitely all nervous, but we were just sharing things that we knew about and loved. So that takes away some of the nerves. Um, and then the way Fancy was set up, if not everyone knows, was that we recorded it ahead of time and then we were there live for Q&A. And it was just so amazing and inspiring and affirming to see all the questions come in and everybody was so interested in the resources, what we used, um, the recipes, how we did it. And you could tell there were so many people working in this field who just wanted more information and resources and to collaborate. So that was really nice that we had already like done the hard work of presenting and we were able to just sit there and focus and engage with people's questions in a really comfortable and relaxed way. That's a nice benefit. I didn't realize that came with it being being online. And so if people want to read your study or hear that presentation, is there a way that they can still do that? <clears throat> Yes, that's still available um, through Fancy. I'm pretty sure on their site. So yes, definitely um, look at the Food and Nutrition Conference and Expo from 2021 online to find that. Yeah, still super relevant, still super, super new. And sounds like it's amazing research that you were able to do. And so let's go back to, you have your, so when did you get, in all of the story, when did you get that NDTR credential? And then how did that kind of, affect or did it affect your path 
that you're taking right now? <clears throat> yes. Uh, so as I mentioned, I went started back to school in 2012, um, finished my bachelor's degree in nutrition at Westchester and rolled right into their MPH with the nutrition focus into the master's in public health with that nutrition concentration. Uh, and that took until 2016. And I was um, at that time a grad assistant in the foods lab and asked if I would be interested in teaching as an adjunct. And I was also then asked to adjunct in the kinesiology department because my prior career and that I was still doing during the master's and all my schooling full time was as um, uh, executive assistant to a master yoga teacher and a director for a nationwide yoga teacher training program. Okay, so fun. what does that job entail? It's, can we just do a little segue? Because that sounds very fancy, but I don't know what you do. <laughs> Right. Me neither. No, I'm <laughs> so uh, what spurred me to go back into school for nutrition was that I had been a yoga teacher prior to that for about 10 years. And as you practice yoga for a, any length of time, it increases your mindfulness around how you feel, around what you eat, around how what you eat makes you feel and, and all of those things. And I was really more interested, not just in talking superficially about nutrition. When you're a yoga teacher, people ask you for nutrition advice. And I didn't feel like I had the science knowledge or the qualifications to talk about that, um, ethically. So, um, in addition to being a yoga teacher, I worked for another yoga teacher doing a lot of managing her schedule nationally and internationally and our website and our events and, um, developing our teacher training programs and the curriculum, um, for there's two levels of yoga certification, a 200 hour level and a 500 hour level. And so we were running both programs at kind of satellite studios around the country. So I just kind of juggled all of that and had a hand in everything, which is why it's hard to understand what it was. Yeah, that's a lot. I of, like, yeah, that's, I was like, it's a lot. <laughs> yeah. So I felt like I did a little bit of everything, um, really was enjoying this passion and nutrition though. I thought I was going back to school for nutrition to finish writing a book on um, how taking sugar out of the diet can be really helpful for health, which is what I was personally feeling at that time. Now there are a million books on that. And <laughs> I also thought maybe I'd have a private wellness practice someday was kind of what was in my head. So I went through the bachelor's, the volunteerism, the master's in public health really changed my mind on what I wanted to do within nutrition. And as I was asked to adjunct, I felt like that would be just kind of the next best thing. And I could sit with my two favorite things, teaching yoga and teaching uh, most of our food-based classes in the foods lab mm -hmm. in nutrition so that I could balance my two favorite things in the world and continue to learn and grow and work with all the amazing people who taught me. Mm -hmm. And so 2016, I started teaching at Westchester and, um, in 2017, I got the DTR credential. Um, as I mentioned before, partly, um, my mentor and colleague, Dr. Subak was encouraging of that. I also saw that, um, one of our grad assistants in the food lab who, um, works for Campbell's food and is an NDTR was talking about how amazing it was to have that credential and how her employer viewed it. And I thought, wow, we, I have graduate students that I'm working with and undergraduate students that I'm educating. And while I don't have an internship and can't take the RD exam, I could take this exam and I would understand better the experience. And I would also have that option of doing some part-time work as a diet tech aide when it aligned with my schedule. So that's what really prompted me to take the exam. 
Yeah, I love that journey on it. And like, thank you for that segue with it, with what you're doing with yoga and then the teaching and then adding that credential. It's a lot of times when I, I talk to people, some, some, some people say like, it doesn't didn't really do like a lot, but it was like that credibility of having that behind your name that just, just adds things to, to what people see and, and confirming the knowledge that and the schooling that you've just been through for that. So you have this credential um, and you're teaching and then you decide to go for your doctorate in education. So like what, what, how, what's, how's the story continue? I still am figuring out what I want to be when I grow up. I think <laughs> um, a little bit. I know that I love teaching. I know that I love nutrition. I know that I love yoga. I know that my heart is really drawn to improving those things for the people who are least likely to get it, right? The people who are least likely to find yoga. So right now I love sharing that in the academic world. So getting my doctorate in education and doing more research seemed like the next step, maybe on my way to something in community nutrition again, and looking at um, how I can work in some of those spaces that I haven't been in for a few years. Yeah. And so tell us about this doctorate you were mentioning before we started recording that it's not in nutrition. So what is it in and why did you find this little extra path and you feel like it's messing up the path towards nutrition that you're taking? I, again, I think I just go back to, I'm still wasn't sure that I wanted to be a registered dietitian. And I think part of that is that as I've talked to many other people who've said the same thing, it can be hard when you're already established with a family and, um, it can be really hard to take a year off of work financially when you're not young anymore. Right. And so I've spent a lot of time in ed on education, but the, at the same time, I've worked full time throughout all of that with the internship. That's a little bit harder to do and to find that part time internship. So I, I knew that potentially I might still want to do that. But for right now, doing the doctorate of education worked in my life and it helped me improve my current career path and would align with any future career in teaching. Right. And also I think the biggest thing that I don't know if everyone realizes about doing any type of doctorate, a PhD an EDD, whatever it is, it's really just about the process of independently learning how to do research and how to put things together to test whether what you, your instincts and what you're doing are really working. So the, you know, doing a, whether it's a PhD or an EDD, it's all about that thinking process in your mind. So I'm not so sure that the topics as important as the process. I'm sure other people would disagree with that, but that's, that's my feeling right now. Yeah, no, that's a really good way to think about that PhD. And it's, it's nice too, as a DTR, a lot of times people just think the RD is the next thing and that's the only other way to expand your education. But the way you're describing getting a PhD, it's, I mean, that's going to help with, again, like you said, any field, including nutrition, just understanding because in nutrition, as you study and you practice ideas come to your head, like, I wonder if this is related. And then it's so easy if you're not reading the research and you're not doing, you're not being diligent in it, you can begin just to make up things in your head without realizing it. So that PhD process of like learning and, and knowing how to do research on your own is invaluable. So that's pretty awesome that you um, are going that route and don't feel like you have to be pinholed into that, that dietitian route and still have a really good career that's enhancing what you're already doing. So, and, and it might lead to a way that I can do the RD, right? It might lead to a way that I can do writing and research and do an internship as a, you know, it all, who knows? I just, uh, like I said, I'm not sure. Yeah. Just kind of going, going with the flow of things. That's, that's super important and, and letting life kind of just fall into place for you. And so with, with the NDTR credential, I think your perspective is super unique. So I want to ask two, two questions based on your perspective of being an adjunct instructor, working in the yoga field, working kind of in community. And so what has been like frustrating or 
um, challenging about holding that NDTR credential in the sphere that you work in? I think just that it's not as recognized as the RD credential, that there are so many jobs. I understand the importance if you're doing medical nutrition therapy of having the RD credential and similar jobs, but there are so many jobs in the community and in education that look amazing, but they have RD required often in the job description. Mm -hmm. And sometimes the NDTR credential seems more like it's limited to a diet aid. Um, sometimes if you're not thinking creatively, right? So I, I think that's just it. You have to really think about it and you need to um, use the credential and know that there are many employers who do value it, but it's just not everyone doesn't see it the same. Yeah, that's a really good way to say that. And I, I, I will say as I have spotlighted um, more in DTRs, I'm finding there's a lot more with master's degrees now and more with the doctor pursuing a doctorate degree or the second person I've had the privilege of talking about that. And so I think that also will just enhance that credential to know that like people have it and they have more, more education. Not that that's the key to everything, but it does make people take a second look. So hopefully it'll change in time, but yeah, that's definitely, I think it is changing. I just got like a message about a NDTR full-time position. Somebody was asking about in another state and that they're paying relocation and sign-on bonus. So I think with the job market, right. I know I was really surprised, but that's um, amazing. How yeah, do so students, students are, how do your students respond to you being an NDTR and a, and a adjunct, adjunct professor? Have you noticed the difference in the relationships there? Yeah, I think, um, honestly, I don't know that they all notice until they get toward the end of their undergraduate in nutrition, but I do know that it helps them ask about what, what other options are out there mm -hmm. besides, you know, especially those students, some know, right, that they want the internship, they want to be an RD, and some know that they really don't or don't right now or can't. So I think it opens up conversation um, on what are the other job possibilities and what else can I do? So I think it's helpful for them to um, see that and know that they have someone they can ask about that. Yeah. I feel like if I was a student under you, I'd be like, oh, she was at NDTR and she's, she's doing great things. So it's a good option. So thank you for being that example in, in the education realm. And so going again, back to your perspective, I like to ask the competition of diversity. So you've worked in community nutrition and you're working in yoga and you mentioned yourself having yoga reach to people who don't won't normally do it. So it sounds like you have this eye for like reaching out to uh, places and groups that maybe don't have the exposure to nutrition or yoga. So what is your experience with diversity and, and the conversation of nutrition and even yoga with, with your, with your experience? Yes, it's not an easy question, right? I, um, I think some of the important things personally that I've, that I think about around our lack of diversity is really listening to what people say and knowing that there are many right choices and right decisions in the world. And just because I think something's wonderful it could be the worst thing for, for other people. So, um, you know, while I look for ways to say, oh my gosh, this, this is so great. This, you know, nutrition idea, this yoga idea, this, whatever. I also know there are many different approaches to it. And I really like listening to what people who don't look like me have to say and think about these things because we need more of those voices in teaching roles. Yeah, that's so well said that, I mean, cause that's for everybody, just listening to someone who doesn't look like you cause it just changes your perspective so much and you understand so much more. And there's things that they, they think of or don't think of that you just would just go right over your head. So that's a really great way to even 
Like, I love that you mentioned the lack of it, but then you talked about a solution for it. So super well-rounded in that response. Yeah, it's, I don't, I don't know if it is or not, but it's, it, it's, it's, it's hard and it's important. And we definitely need more voices that aren't this way or that way out there. We need all the voices and all of that. And that impacts research in a, in a great way, just like your study with intellectual disabilities, like speaking to that voice. So thank you for what you're doing. And so anything, anything that you want to share with the NDTR audience of encouragement, of advice, anything at all, I'm just going to open it up to you here. Follow what feels right to you. Don't force a path that isn't working for you. And don't think that you need a specific credential like an RD to be happy in your work. If you love nutrition, there are so many options. And really the NDD, NDTR credential, if you've done the education, it's, you know, it's just, it, it's a test and it'll help you remember your knowledge when you study for it. It'll make you more successful. And it's good to have that credential, but just follow your heart and you'll find it. I love that. That's so, that's encouraging. Thank you, Lori, so much for your time. Thank you everyone for watching. If you have any questions, please let them down in the comments below. And Lori, how can people um, follow you or, or keep up with what you're doing in the field? Yeah, um, definitely on Instagram at Simplify Wellness. I have a Facebook page, Simpl Simplify Wellness as well. Um, and I think that's it. That sounds good. So follow on Insta and Facebook. That's awesome. Thank you again for your time, Lori. And we will see you in our next podcast.